Hello, my name is Satoshi Matsuoka. I'm the director of Weekend RCCS. And it's my pleasure today to give you a talk on overview of Fugaku, which is the first exascale supercomputer in the world. Its applications, focusing on various novel types of applications such as COVID prevention, and of course, the future perspectives. And I'm really, it's a really pleasure to give this presentation at the Fujitsu DSEI Symposium. Firstly, about Recan and Recan RCCS. Recan is a major national laboratory of Japan, specializing in many branches of science. And Recan RCCS is one of the 13 centers, research centers at Recan. And our research objectives are to do research on computing, high-end computing. And we characterize our research objectives in more detail by saying that we are studying science of computing, by computing, and for computing. Science of computing is what you might also call computer science, that we study computing itself as the target of scientific discipline. And these will cover various areas that are pertinent to high performance computing, such as designing efficient processors, software, various algorithm, basic algorithms, as well as achieving the programmability, power efficiency, and so forth. Science by computing is to utilize the immense power as provided by science of computing and apply them to other disciplines, other scientific disciplines, such as environmental disaster, medical, pharmaceutical, energy, carbon neutrality, materials, and, and manufacturing, as, as well as many other fields. And science for computing are the areas where the benefits of particular disciplines that are outside of, let's say, computer science would allow the computing to advance, such as quantum, neomorphic, et cetera. And so by the collective unity of these three areas, science of, by and for computing, we achieve the next giant leap in computing as we have done for our past supercomputers such as a K computer and Alphagaku. And we're a fairly uh, sizable center constituting several hundred people. And we have many research teams as well as operational teams covering various branches of science of computing and science by computing. Now about Fugaku. So Fugaku, we claim, is the first exascale, not necessarily exaflop, but exascale supercomputer designed with the application first philosophy. And Fugaku, the name Fugaku, is an alternative name for Mount Fuji which is, of course, our national monumental mountain in Japan. And uh, the reason we named it Fugaku is for the fact that it symbolizes the idealism that, that we behold on compu well, computing and, for, in fact, high in computing, in that the mountain, as a standalone mountain, Mount Fuji, is not only very picturesque, but also has a high, very high peak and fast, it has the highest peak in Japan. But also has a very broad base as a standalone mountain. And having high peak represents its immense performance and scalability. But also broad base signifies its applicability to broad areas of science, technology, and engineering, as well as other areas, 
broad applications and broad user base, and also connections to other branches of IT. So that's Fugaku, or Mount Fuji, is our flagship supercomputer. Now, of course, designing this machine or supercomputer to satisfy these rather contradictory goals of high performance and broad applicability was a huge challenge. In fact, it was a high risk moonshot type of R&D. Because, you know, if I may say so, you know, Fujitsu, of course, who was our partner, main partner in this project, was instrumental in working with us to design this new chip. But if it were not for this collaborative, not only this collaborative relationship, but the entire scientific community or the, of utilizing supercomputing coming together under the umbrella of Weekend Fujitsu and also associated companies that are partners with Fujitsu coming under the, those umbrella, that umbrella, it would not, as a national project funded by the government, such achievement would not have been possible because it had been just too much of a high risk for any one company to assume. So, you know, it was a big national project, much like uh, how NASA went to the moon. And the resulting AC4X FX processor, which is the heart of Fuaku, is not only three times more powerful on average compared to the competing processors, general purpose CPUs that you see in other machines. And also it's three times more power efficient. But now power efficiency was also mostly important because otherwise the machine would have been three times bigger or you know, in terms of power consumption, which would not have been sustainable. So it was not only the goal was to make it fast, but make it very power efficient. And general purpose, well, we adopted the ARM instruction set, changing significantly from the predecessor of Fugaku, which was a K computer, which sported the Spark instruction set, which was in, to some, in some sense was a diminishing ecosystem. So adopting a very broad ecosystem was very important. And we adopted ARM with its vector extensions. But, and of course, this would not automatically guarantee everything will work, but so far it's been very, very positive. And of course, we added some new features to accelerate new breeds of applications such as AI. Now, Fugaku, which, constitute, which consists of 160,000 nodes in total of such, that is 160,000 of these AC4FX CPU, now, of course, is the largest supercomputer ever built. But if you put this in context, compared to other IT infrastructure of the world. Well, for example, the Fugaku, the Fugaku supercomputer would be equivalent to about 20 million smartphones, which of course runs the same code because that's you know, the same ARM processor, or would be equivalent to about 300,000 servers. Now, these coincidentally happens to be about the number of units shipped in entire Japan annually. So this means that if you have a, a few Fugakus, it will cover the entire computing capability of Japan as a country. And of course, we have a fairly large country and, and a fairly economically prosperous country. So to have a supercomputer which would match the, the remaining computing capability provided by the other IT infrastructures, that's the magnitude of Fugaku. Now, of course, you know, we also can also claim we also claim that uh, Fugaku is the first exascale supercomputer. But what do we mean by exascale? And some people may uh, claim no, Fugaku is sort of uh, pre-exascale. So to set things straight, um, well, we believe that the, the statements, all the statements, are actually they're all correct in some sense because there are various definitions of exascale. 
So one definition would be would be to say that the FP64 or 64-bit floating point calculation performance would be beyond the exaflop and either an achieved RP, meaning uh, the actual benchmarking run, let's say on the top half hundred, or the, uh, I'm sorry, the achieved RP, which is the peak, uh, the theoretical peak performance, or the achieved uh, RMAX, which is achieved uh, LIMPAC number on the top 500. Either of the, uh, well, usually R peak is greater than RMAX. So either of the metric exceeding one exaflop. Yeah. By this metric, Fugaku is not an exascale, exascale machine because it's about half of that. However, there's very little correlation of such massive dense linear algebra computed in our FP64 with real applications. So, um, so this exascale in this case will be rather symbolic and not associated with real application benefits. So the different, so an alternative definition will be any sort of floating point of any precision that's supported by the machine exceeding an exaflop. And in this context, um, Fugaku is an exascale machine because um, in catalog or peak spec, um, it easily goes beyond exaflop. And also um, in measure performance, the new benchmark HVLI, which measures the AI, uh, which is AI proxy, sort of uh, does mixed precision in LIMPAC, uh, we achieve two exaflop in actual computed performance. But Fugaku is not the first machine to achieve measured exaflop or catalog exaflop in reduced precision. Because for example, Ucris Summit has also done that in both peak and measured in some, other, some applications. We believe that, uh, but you know, everybody would think that Ocris is more of a pre-exascale machine, but not exascale. So we believe that the real exaflop benefit ex is not is not measured in terms of exaflop. Real exascale is not measured in terms of exaflop, but rather exascale really means that the real applications, a portfolio of applications that are important to the machine and society and science and so forth would achieve significant, in fact, uh, uh, somewhere, in the, somewhere in the order of two orders of magnitude speed up compared to the 10 to 20 petaflop machines that were instituted in the early uh, 2011, 2012 timeframe. So Fugaku actually was designed that way. And uh, we achieved about 70 X performance on average on nine target applications. And we were able to achieve this not necessarily targeting any sort of benchmarking performance, but rather we had an application first philosophy because at the end of the day, application performance or real application performance across the board is the most important metric for a supercomputer. So this is why we, meet, we claim that uh, Wiaku is an exascale machine that in that we achieved two orders of magnitude class performance gains over those previous 10 petaflop class machines. In fact, these nine uh, applications were chosen very carefully from what were called the priority areas of prior issues. And these are, uh, these are sort of uh, sustainability type of applications mostly, ranging from health and me medicine, disaster prevention, climate, um, also uh, energy uh, carbon neutrality, and also manufacturing from, uh, from uh, material scale all the way up to very large structures. And of, and of course, some basic science. So the goal was to achieve almost two order of magnitude speed up compared to the predecessor K computer across most of the applications in these areas. But of course, you know, we couldn't have several hundred applications. So we picked one out of each. And of course, each one was very divergent in their uh, characteristics compared to the others. More than 10 years uh, since the inception of the concept of building the Fugaku as an exascale machine to the deployment and, the, and starting of the production in 2021. 
the first concept of Aku, a group of us, including me, uh, first thought, you know, this was this was the time when a lot of the countries, US, uh, Europe, European countries, Japan, and China to some extent, started really thinking about, you know, what would be the machine to be built around the time frame of 2020. And the target performance goal was deemed to be exascale. And so we set our, um, you know, we had a lot of international meetings, but also had domestic meeting to really to concretify the inception of the project. And this was called SDHPC. And this was in 2010. And this was even before the K computer was completed. And after that, many things happened. I won't go into details, but um, you know, 2018, uh, 2014, the projects, after prep, lots of uh, preparation projects, 2014, the main R&D project started. 2018, we had the first chip. 2019, the machine started installation. 2020, a lot of things, stuff got operational. And 2021, in March, we started the operation officially. So it was a very, it took a long, it took a long time, but now we have a very fine machine. So, um, so this is the process we created, um, a square effects with Fujitsu. Um, uh, so it's an ARM processor, but world with world leading from HPC performance. And um, so a lot can be said about the processor. Um, it's the first server CPU that we know with 7 nanometer process. Of course, there are now uh, ones from AMD and so forth, but, but I think this is the first, we believe this is the first one. And like I said, it has these uh, performance properties. But it's not, that's not all. We also, as a supercomputer, we also designed this uh, novel network uh, sort of carryover from K, but completely integrated not only the network, but also the switch fabric onto the processor. So there are no external switches, except for the IO. There are no external switches, unlike other machines. Also, system architecture perspective, um, we, it's a, sort of a disaggregated architecture in that um, we have uh, we have very flat memory access from any part of the machine to any other part of the machine using RDMA without direct CPU intervention. And this allows for really low latency communication between the nodes. So you know, as a supercomputer, you know, we not only design the processor, but we design the, the IO and the network, especially the interconnect, to scale up to and beyond 160,000 nodes. So uh, here are some details. Um, of course, there are a lot of materials out there. Um, so if you're really interested, you're very welcome to be up. This is a little bit older. I think this was a little old. I think the um, the peak, uh, the position performance is now uh, 3.3 teraflops uh, for MP64. This was the lower clock, actually. Um, and But but it has it supports MP64, MP32. Oh no, this is a new, I'm sorry, this is a new material. So the peak performance in, in double is 3.3, in single is 6.7, and half precision is 13 teraflops. But more importantly, um, the peak memory bandwidth is uh, one terabyte per second using HPM2. It's, uh, it's the first CPU, general purpose CPU, to use high bandwidth memory technology uh, with on die integration. And it still is. I mean, there have been precedents, of course, of using HPM2 on GPUs, but not on the general purpose CPU, and not yet. Uh, as, of, as of this date, as far as they know, they have been done. So with respect, respect to power efficiency, um, when the when Fugaku, the first uh, prototype nodes were constructed, we got number one on the green 500 metric, which is which basically ranks the machine, all the supercomputers on the top 500 in terms of their power efficiency. So we got 16 point, uh, about 6.9 gigaflops per watt, um, which basically was enough, well, but it was a close call, but uh, enough to get us to number one. But what was important at the time um, is not so much we got number one, it's just uh, you know that's just, just for demonstrative purposes, and of course now with the new green five hundred, there are new chips like A one hundred, which has even better power efficiency. But what's more important? What's important is um, that we achieved this as a general purpose CPU. So uh, if you look at this graph, um, 
uh, the blue, the dots are the machines, and the on the x-axis is the is the is the ranking of the machines on grade five hundred, and the y-axis is the gigafloss gigafloss watt achieved. The blue dots are CPU only, general purpose CPU only machines, and orange are machines with some sort of um, acceleration, like GPU general purpose one like GPUs or more specialized, uh, less, you know, much, much less general purpose um, for those types of machines. So when you look at the list, um, the, you know, up to rank 38 or you know, we're number one, but up to number 37, all orange, meaning there are some sort of accelerated machine. So the, so the CPUs, play a very minor part in the performance. So, you know, this, you know, the general purpose CPUs are always thought to be much, much inferior compared to these accelerated machines in terms of power efficiency. But we have demonstrated that uh, if you incorporate these uh, acceleration features, both in terms of memory bandwidth and all, uh, especially in terms of a high streaming bandwidth, coupled with the uh, um, appropriate compute uh, compute capabilities, uh, we can achieve just as competent uh, power efficiency as these specialized machines without sacrificing general purpose programmability. In fact, we are three times more power efficient compared to the next general purpose CPU, um, which is consistent with what I had said, three times more power efficient. So this, so being rather than being number one being important, this demonstration of three uh, three times more power efficiency compared to general purpose CPUs in the past with older technologies, and also the matching by and by large matching the power efficiency of these accelerated type of chip machines but without losing the generality because we're general purpose CPUs, that's the most important achievement. We believe that was demonstrated with this ranking. And of course, you know, um, after that we have the full machine and uh, we've been, uh, uh, has been crowned uh, number one, number uh, on across the board on uh, full machine scalable benchmarks of, of all kinds. And we have a number one on three consecutive editions in a row. Basically, cloud features. So Fugaku is basically a, also can be accessed as a cloud. Of course, there's traditional batch queue submission, but every user, Fugaku user, can utilize this cloud features. Not just people who use the cloud, but you know there are a lot of applications. Even though you may submit in the batch queue, they want to have uh, cloud support features. For example, they may want to access some other you know data from some other sources using S3 protocol. Or, uh, or it may be inverse. You know, some of the data in Fugaku may, uh, people may want to access using S3. So, uh, so again, Fugaku basically uh, supports uh, uh, standard, uh, very standard uh, cloud software stack features. So it can uh, interoperate well with uh, public cloud platforms such as uh, uh, Google, Google, AWS, Oracle, etc. In fact, because of this, uh, we're working with uh, various cloud platform vendors, not only platform vendors, but also cloud service providers that have uh, various specialized cloud services, like, a, like application service providers and or some sort of other types of uh, service providers, such as those that provide virtual cluster services on top of clouds. So uh, we're working with all these um, vendors. Now, there are some new recent additions like Rescale, um, that basically has uh, uh, provides all these uh, uh, ASP uh, access to uh, very popular applications. So instead of a backend going to something like Azure or uh, uh, or you know, something like uh, Amazon Cloud, uh, they they can there they can be now uh, and pretty soon you'll be able to uh, redirect the backend to Agaku if you have the resource privilege to access Agaku. So because of all these provisions, Fugaku, probably the most notable contribution to Fugaku um, since its inception has been its um, anti-COVID achievements. Because when Fugaku was being installed, um, 
around the end of 2019, when we started installing it at the end of 2019. Uh, actually, it was December of 2019. That was exactly when the word COVID-19 started surfacing um, in, in the press. And as the month, uh, as the you know, days passed, it became serious, more serious, and more serious, and started affecting the supply chains for building Fuyaku and, and also facilitating Fuyaku at our data center. And there were a lot of, you know, there were a lot of problems and there were a lot of heroics by Fujitsu and also by us, a little bit by us. And, uh, you know, there were lots of um, COVID prevention measures we had to institute so that, uh, you know, if anybody gets infected, things don't stop because back in those days, the quarantine procedures had to be much more strict because we didn't know what the hell was going on. Uh, so, you know, there are a lot of, you know, well, there are complexities now, but there are a lot of complexities then. And that really got us to think, well, can we, should we be using Fugaku? Because, you know, Fugaku was, that was being rolled in. And we're, and some of the nodes were already being uh, tested. They were uh, turned on, being tested, and started running the you know, operating system and test, you know, and test codes and some of the early apps. So we said, um, can't we, uh, because we've been developing all these sciences and applications as co-design targets and optimizing them on the, on the Fugaku. Can we, we you utilize Fugaku and also the sciences and the applications to really combat uh, COVID-19? And can we do this from real molecular or even um, uh, quantum physics, level, quantum chemistry levels? All the, way, all the way up to more of a, you know, for medical pharma purposes, up to societal or epidemiological purposes, like how to prevent uh, aerosol infections, and and even look at social phenomena, like what would be effective lockdown, what would be economic implications of lockdown, how can we minimize the economic loss? So uh, there, are, uh, we solicited applications, uh, anti-COVID applications and projects, but only. But you know those that can be justifiably requiring the immense resources provided for Gaku. In fact, the resources provided to these projects would be equivalent to a stand, a, a sizable, let's say, top fifty, top fifty to top twenty to top fifty supercomputer for each of the project. Okay, so Fugaku is that large machine. But if you take like any of these projects, they could, you know, they would be able to. Uh, Get, they would get resource that would be equivalent to, to dominating uh, a sizable, you know, or some country would be their top super, supercomputers for the throughout the year to combat COVID-19. So, so it was a huge endeavor and um, we got fantastic results. In fact, that allowed us to really curtail infections in Japan. So Fugaku, everybody in Japan knows Fugaku. Women, men, grandpas, grandmas, little children, they all know Fugaku because they know that Fugaku helped to prevent COVID transmission. And I'll describe that. So uh, one of the uh, area was, uh, one of the projects was done by uh, Dr. Professor Yasushi Okuno, who is a professor at Kyoto University, but also one of our, um, uh, one of our division head uh, his, his specialty is pharmaceuticals, and so he was. So he does. He does lots of. He has a whole bunch of uh, for, uh, in, in soco drug uh, development project using advanced computing. But when he got the opportunity, his thinking was, "How uh, can I use Fugaku to do uh, basically um, discover um, a, a medical cure?" or a pharmaceutical cure for COVID-19 uh, out of existing drugs or uh, what are typically called a, a, a transpositional use of uh, these uh, pharmaceutical substances. The problem is A, there are you know, a few, at least a few thousand of them and, uh, and doing very, very detailed study of their uh, effectiveness, for example, do doc docking is enormously expensive. I mean, you can have approximated methods, but there are no good for pharmaceuticals. So the resolution, both in terms of not just in terms of spatial, but also in terms, but also time resolution, 
required uh, for such endeavor is massive. So on a K computer, even if you had a K dedicated K computer for a year, uh, it would take, um, you know, it would take, I'm sorry, to do this on a, of a single proteomic target, human target. On a K computer, it will take more than a year. Now it's been more than a year since COVID-19 started. So maybe we, by this time we had discovered uh, uh, a good medicine for just one, one of the targets. But you know, on Fugaku, we can do this in two days. So for example, this is a, a this is the main protease of, um, which would be a drug target for um, <clears throat> uh, substances. And this, in this case, it's called a niclosamide, which is basically um, you know, a drug for, uh, for parasites that are typically administered in places like Southeast Asia. Like when we go to India, you know, they sell these by, you know, you can go to a pharmacy, you can get these to get rid of your worms in your intestines. Um, uh, in Japan, this is not, um, uh, it's not a, it's not, a, um, it's not, it's not been um, uh, approved yet, unfortunately. But you know, it's been it's been approved in many countries with for these parasites too as a cure for these parasites. And uh, and, and it was discovered that the uh, niclosamid had very very high potency in terms of being able to block these targets. So you know, this the uh, purple. This purple substance is a niclosamide that just fits into this uh, pocket where, and when, when it goes into the pocket, basically prevents um, attachment of the, of the virus to the target. And then, of course, um, we do simulations under for many types of social situations. And uh, there are lots of collaborators from uh, not just from the academia, but from companies like Daikin for air, for air conditioning, uh, construction companies, because we needed data. For, for the buildings to be able to uh, uh, be able to simulate the effect of, um, uh, of ventilation in various uh, uh, in, in rooms and restaurants and so forth, and lots of transportation companies and even mask companies, but uh, transportation companies came to us and said, "Well, you know, can you analyze what will be the best means of action when we have well, trains?" Going to become hotspot. What about the theaters and concert halls? What about stadiums? And also, the government asked us to you know, work, work with various government agencies because they're also very interested. Like, for example, COVID City wanted, really wanted what's, you know, what would happen? What was the best prevention method for preventing infections in ambulances? Suntory was really interested because they wanted to prevent, uh, have some mitigation measures for infection in restaurants that they ran. And again, these are not simple because we may see, for example, if you see here is a, we do, we do simulations on trains. They may have, you know, some people may claim, well, you know, well, we've done some CFD simulations on trains, but that's no, doing CFD simulations of, uh, on trains is pretty much useless in itself. The reason is you don't have the people. So you need to have all the people standing like in light packed and Japanese commuter trains at London tube. And then, you know, bury their occupancy or even have them be moving or have doors open at, at station stops. And, and then, you know, we may put in an infected person in there, make them cough and let the aerosols. This is sort of a simulation that was not possible using any sort of commercial CFD software. Uh, any and ha has not been done before. So, so a lot of so some people you know who have half-hearted knowledge said, "Well, no, we, we can no. This is CFD it's simple. No, it's not. It's something that was enabled by a new software based on the new types of algorithms, which are expensive, but allows us to allow us to." do the precise replication, creating these uh, digital twins of social situations, only by which this kind of simulation is effective. In fact, we have, we have had to generate all kinds of social scenarios from offices. You know, here, one exemplar is partition. You, know, you may have an office when people sit you know, across and so forth. 
and then the company was starting to put in partitions. But we quickly demonstrated, and this was again shown on TV, that when the partition is too low, it doesn't do anything. It just doesn't block this. It just the you know, the aerosol just spills over to the other side. Whereas the only the difference is only like 20 centimeters. So the standard Japanese office partition is 120 centimeters in height. When people sit down and and that's to uh, the, was designed that way to let people see each other. Um, but um, but that was a little too low. But we said we said simulation was 140 centimeters. That made a vast difference. Basically, blocked the aerosols. Only 20 centimeter difference. And when it's 160 meter, it really didn't, didn't change from 140. And so as soon as we released this, this was shown on you know advertised on TV and also on the internet. Companies went and manufactured these higher partitions, and then you know companies start and the, the client companies start putting in by mass immediately. And thus preventing infections in offices and allowing people to get back to work. For concert halls and also stadiums, we also did simulation of halls and stadiums for Olympics. Um, dining situations, uh, of course, uh, more importantly for transportation like taxis, airplanes, and there got really interesting results for taxis. Um, karaoke, which is of course very important in Japan, also in the UK. Uh, pubs, um, commuter trains, and also you know, we did things like double face mask because uh, you know the, uh, basically CDC, US CDC said you know, double masking is, is really effective. And we said that doesn't make sense, so we did the you know a detailed simulation. And although of course double masking is not bad, um, it's not you know it really doesn't do much good beyond wearing a single mask properly. In fact, in some cases, double masking, you, you feel a little more suffocated, especially in hot, hotter climates. So, um, so if you can tolerate it, double masking is fun. But, but you know, putting on a single mask tightly around your face is more, much more important and just as effective as wearing double mask. And we still demonstrated that, again, using simulation. We'll travel through the air, through the environment. There will be some various effects like the body thermal, um, Basically, elevating the uh, the you know elevating the the aerosols and so forth. It gets uh, it gets breathed in, breathed in, um, with or without masks to some degree. Then it reaches your lung, and uh, there are infection models, um, various types of infection models, which are basically uh, um, uh, ba which basically tells you uh, you know with proper param parametrization. Um, what would be the chance of infection um, given certain you know, certain conditions? So, this kind of end-to-end -end infection model has never been done before. I mean, we asked the experts and said, "You know, this is something really." You know, they have like partial knowledge of this. so they've been able to experiment with certain things empirically, discover something, but this they have never been able to do this end-to-end -end modeling of infections from someone who's infected from their respiratory system to someone else's respiratory system to the cells to, to, to which they can infect it. This has never been done before. So we're still working on this, but we have a rudimentary version. Um, that we don't have full version yet, but we have some rudimentary version uh, with some more simplified uh, infection models. Um, and uh, with that, we can, uh, even with that simpler model, um, so it's not the full model yet, but with, with, uh, with a simpler model of, uh, of um, of infection uh, coupled with the uh, or drop aerosol simulation, we can do things like uh, do the proper risk assessment at, uh, at uh, pubs, and then see what kind of um, these uh, preventive measures may how how effective they they could be. So um, let's say you have a scenario where one person is affected, and then you know people are talking or cough, you know, and they're basically spewing uh, aerosol over. And um, uh, we don't know which who's infected, really, because of course we can't tell um, because these are typically asympt asymptomatic uh, uh, transmitters. So, what are the chances that uh, if if a single person is infected, 
that someone gets, you know, and sits at a certain position within a restaurant, what are the chances of any other person being infected? And if we take preventive measures or if people are vaccinated, how can how much can we lower the, the, the overall risk of uh, transmission? So we can have this matrix where you know, somebody, uh, there are 16 seating positions, including the, including the, the, store, the storekeeper. And, um, uh, I, and from, I, we can have this a matrix where we have the ID of the infected person and then the, the, the average risk of infection of every other people. And then, um, so, uh, and we can, uh, and certain, in certain times when you're, of course, obviously when you're in close proximity, you're very, there's a high risk and so forth. But overall, we can come up with um, uh, the whole risk assessment of how many people get infected. Well, there's the expectation that at least one person will be infected. In this case, like 4%. But, you know, have thousands of pubs, so restaurants, so, you know, there's a high risk of infection throughout the town. Then when we have preventive measures, like putting shields or putting the you know, seats farther apart, or then, of course, the, we can lower the risk. But to what extent? We don't, nobody knew the quantification of that. But now we can do this. In fact, we can say that the uh, uh, course with ventilation is effective. But when you do, like, you know, have air conditioning, kitchen duct, even, and when you seat people up farther apart, we can really lower the risk of infection, the transmission by almost several factors. And we can also have results for people being vaccinated and so forth. And that significantly reduces the risk of transmission in these uh, restaurant situations. So, so the combination of all these measures allow for reopening of the society, but we can show this in a very quantified fashion uh, and with a very detailed simulation. So uh, something like this has been picked, again, picked up in use, as I've said repeatedly, but not only this, but mentioned by the press, but the Prime Minister Suga, unfortunately, will be stepping down, had mentioned even at a press conference that um, um, it's the effectiveness of wearing masks has been demonstrated by Fugaku. So basically, everybody should be wearing masks. And we're very proud. And so we're very proud of this. And, uh, and, and it just demonstrates the power of supercomputing and advanced, uh, uh, advanced methods thereof can save the society. And of course, could be applicable to other applications too. So, with that, I'd like to end my talk and um, uh, hopefully. Um, I've been able to go through some of the results of uh, introduce Fugaku and introduce some of the innovative results, um, uh, especially against COVID-19. But of course, Fugaku, the operation had just started and uh, we hope to see many, many more in, um, innovative results very soon. So thank you very much. Dr. Satoshi Matsuoka, thank you so much. I know you're going to join us for questions now, um, and uh, I think I will field them. Uh, we only have one microphone, so I'm going to uh, run around with said microphone as you <laughs> ask questions and hold it whilst trying not to spray droplets over you, having just watched that video. Um, I, I, uh, it was a fantastic talk. There was so much in it. Um, I was amused that at one point you said we had to narrow down the use cases, and one of those use cases was investigating the fundamental laws and evolution of the universe, which, um, if that's narrowing the scope, then, uh, then I think it was still a pretty broad scope. Um, I think everybody can see how critical simulation uh, cyber physical infrastructure, Society 5.0, is going to be for policy making in the future. Um, and, uh, and I thought the use of COVID-19 was a, was a really neat example of the kind of things we can, uh, we can do with this, but of course applicable across the national security domain too. Um, so I'm going to abuse my privilege of chair once again by asking the first question, and then I will turn to the audience um, uh, for your participation. M my um, question was going to be, when um, you look at sort of potential national security applications, wider applications, um, how, how could you see high performance compute and supercomputing um, assisting other sectors like national security, like defense in the future? Uh, I think you might have the sound off. Am I on? Okay. Um, so, of course, in defense, there are multitudes of um, technologies that are assembled to constitute um, uh, your defense mechanism, um, including uh, 
you know, the traditional weapons like uh, you know, planes and tanks and so forth, to uh, a lot of the modern uh, warfare, like in cyber and cyber warfare and so forth. And in any of these situations, and I think it's, you know, it's you know, a preaching to the choir, saying you, know, you really need to simulate the various situations in, in high detail in order to assess any sort of effectiveness of your uh, strategies or your, you know, your tactics or your weapons and so forth. And, um, and of course, um, you know, in Japan, we don't do this as much, actually, although, although of course, our SDF employs some supercomputing, but you know, this is done significantly in countries like the US and of course in the UK and so forth. And, uh, uh, and including some, of, you know, even, even including a nuclear stewardship in the US and other countries. Uh, now, uh, some of the new methods uh, which we have developed for Fugaku, um, uh, you know, uh, with the demonstrated this time uh, with the COVID-19 example, but the, uh, and then kind of skipped because some of the uh, talks, segments of the talk were edited out. But really started as a um, uh, as a very detailed high resolution CFD, uh, multi physics CFD applications that they can scale to you know, tens of thousands of nodes. Um, and, and our primary application, it's uh, it's mostly like gas turbines, uh, automotives, and also things like uh, internal combustion engines. Uh, you know, but you know, going to resolutions that are let's say one or two orders of magnitude compared to what you can achieve in the commercial software. Now, of course, you know things like turbines. They're uh, they're also applied to jet engines. Um, things like uh, you know uh, I, uh, a lot of the combustion uh, modeling uh, is also very important in these uh, transportation vehicles, and of course, CAT in general for uh, various types of kind of vehicle dynamics and control. So, um, uh, what we're seeing is uh, you know with these high resolution and also uh, being able to generate. Um, these uh, digital twins at much, much faster speed as compared to the past. So we have techniques for COVID-19. Uh, one, one of the benefits of our technique was it being able to generate uh, the digital twins at massive speeds, not just to compute them, but to generate the digital twins. Whereas in the past, there's a lot of these CFD apps because they're based on unstructured grids. And it'll, it'll take you know, uh, you know, weeks or even months to generate the appropriate resolution meshes. Um, in order to be able to do the appropriate resolution computing, which is submillimeter scale of CFD. Uh, but now we can do this in like five minutes. So, um, uh, so the massive advances will allow different scenarios to be played out and, and yeah. uh, uh, or better or worse, well, uh, you know, the results may be better or worse, but there are many uh, simulation scenarios we carried out, which I think will be very critical for uh, uh, these uh, defense uh, security type of applications. Yeah, I was really struck by um, what you said about t temporal resolution. Having been involved in simulation engines here, um, that's something that uh, we, yes. we, we really struggle with, and I think that that's that that's going to be absolutely crucial. So, I mean, what did you say? It was uh, the difference between two days and one year um, with previous technologies, uh, which is just remarkable. So, oh, yes. um, yeah, uh, yeah, with that. Oh, so yeah, sorry, please go. On. I, I was uh, I was going to hand over um, my great privilege of getting to ask you questions to the audience, but I promise I will seize it back uh, if the opportunity arises. So, um, does anybody have uh, any questions that they'd like to ask? Ah, okay, uh, two. I'll tell you what, I'll start with Steve and I'll come across. Steve, do you just want to introduce yourself as I... Uh, I'm happy to hold it, sure. Yeah, good morning. Uh, Steve Campion from Fujitsu um, in the Defence and National Security Division. So. Uh, I guess my question is, is um, with the advances of quantum computing, will that render supercomputing irrelevant? Well, you know, we can, we can, we have, um, we used to have 12 centers, now we have 13. And uh, so uh, because the 13th center is a center for quantum computing. So we now have a center for iPhone computing, which is my center. And then we have this, you know, center for quantum computing, which is, and we collaborate very tightly. And um, and the reason being uh, several fold. One is, of course, that in order to develop quantum computers, supercomputers are essential. So it's by no accident, like in the US, a lot of these quantum programs are being run in either in very large companies like Google that have massive compute capability in their data centers or at DOE labs, which also have massive compute capabilities at, you know, traditional compute capabilities at their, with their supercomputers. Uh, because you need a tremendous amount of compute 
um, in order to simulate these devices, simulate the computers, quantum, behavior of quantum computers, and also to seek for hybrid methods. Um, now, hybrid methods, I mentioned this because it's, uh, it's, it's a typical misnomer that uh, computing we know today will be replaced entirely by, by, by quantum. In fact, there are, uh, the range of um, applications, if you look at the whole spectrum, the portfolio of applications that we run on our machines today, uh, the range of applications that could be supplanted by quantum are rather small. Um, uh, you know, well, they're important, but if you, you know, there are many other applications that will not be supplanted because you know, they're, uh, for their, uh, because the complexity of the algorithms is already linear. So there's not much to you know, quantum computers can do to achieve quantum speed up. So, um, uh, so uh, well, there are some problems like material science um, or, and also some other applications, of course, like defense applications like cartography, um, but uh, uh, typically those that are MP, uh, MP hard that, that are in the realm of uh, quantum computers. Um, uh, so, you know, those are, you know, to, just too hard to be tackled. It's in many cases, um, some cases they can be relaxed and approximated, in which case, you know, you can use conventional technology quite well. Some problems may require quantum. And so we're doing a lot of research along with our quantum computing colleagues to see, you know, where, you know, where the boundaries are. So, uh, but, uh, but, uh, but in any case, um, quantum computers and conventional computers will go hand in hand because uh, fundamentally, you know, so there are many aspects of computing, which uh, in fact, the dominant uh, aspects of computing are not replaceable by, well, there's no benefit in replacing them with quantum, but some are extremely beneficial by replacing with quantum. Thank you. Um, right. I feel like I'm, uh, I'm learning live on stage. It's a slightly weird experience. <laughs> hmm? Hello, uh, Dr. Dave Snelling here. I think, Satoshi, it's been a very long time since we've met, and I would like to see you again in Tokyo sometime. Mm -hmm. So I want to yeah. ask, uh, ask a question on behalf of the UK academic community. Fugaku is obviously a very exciting device for use in research and science and sociology and everything else. What if, if, if it is possible for UK academics to use Fugaku system in a collaborative arrangement? If so, what's the process like? How complicated is it? Ah, yes. Um, so, uh, firstly, uh, well, uh, it's great to see you again. And uh, um, I'm, I'm very happy, you know, that, you know, you're staying safe and everything. Um, so, uh, we certainly would have, uh, would have loved to have had the opportunity to go there in person, but we're not quite there yet. I'm vaccinated and so forth, but we're not quite there yet. Now, um, uh, for the academics, um, uh, that, that's a great question because um, what's unique about Fugaku is we are not placing any restrictions on who can apply for usage. There are no, um, there are no sort of uh, restrictions that you have to be supported by the Japanese government or Japanese national or you, you belong to the national lab, Japanese national lab or whatever, or the university, whatever. Or, uh, any, anybody, let's say, in a UK university uh, as long as, you know, they pass these excellent control and all those uh, criteria can apply for time on Fugaku. But of course, it's very competitive. So um, it's not, it's no guarantee you can use the machine. Uh, you, but, you know, uh, but the application is open to anybody in the world, basically. Um, so, uh, so I encourage, uh, in fact, of course, we have collaborations with the UK University, like, you know, like, like Cambridge and Oxford and so forth, uh, and also like ECMWF and you know, those types of uh, uh, centers and institutions. But you know, even if you are a you know, or like you're Bristol and so forth, but but again, uh, you you'll be eligible to apply uh, and uh, submit an application and accept it just as you know if you were a Japanese uh, someone from the Japanese university. So, so it's, it's, it's an open platform. Thank you. I think we have time for one more question. I have one I am um, very keen to ask, but I should yield the privilege. Uh, does anybody else have any questions in the audience? Otherwise, I shall uh, seize this opportunity. Oh, you've taken too long. So, uh, so my question was, um, I'm really interested in the relationship between high performance compute and breakthroughs in AI uh, ML research. And I wondered mm -hmm. if you could just give us yes. a little bit of a, um, an overview or an insight into the kind of work you're doing and, and the kind of breakthroughs that you're seeking to achieve. Yeah, so, you know, AI was, was given, basically given a rebirth 
uh, with, uh, with the advances of HPC, you know, pre algorithms such as deep learning. Uh, that was invented, uh, you know, depending on who you ask, in the 70s and 80s, 1970s, 80s, but to just too expensive to be run on uh, traditional uh, computers back then. Um, but, you know, the computing advanced by seven orders of magnitude, and now we and certainly became useful. But then we're seeing this immense uh, increase in the complexity of the, uh, of the network to the extent that uh, if you want to be at the top of the pinnacle, if you want to really you know, get some pinnacle results, uh, much like the GP, uh, language models like GP3 and, uh, and even the more complex models, or things like Alpha Fold, um, then you really need, you know, basically you need, you need a super, uh, large supercomputer in a very large one to be even competitive. So um, supercomputing uh, was basically the uh, uh, the powers of computing is basically what fe what's fueled the uh, regeneration of AI. But then there are uh, many interesting developments uh, where it's the, the relationship had become much more mutual, and that uh, now we're seeing uh, at least a lot of the application groups uh, and also some of the system groups in our at my center and also collaborators are extremely, uh, uh, you know, they're, they have, they are investigating these AI techniques uh, in many ways to see if they can be incorporated into uh, their simulations or their libraries or you know, their, their methodology and so forth. For example, we just, um, our, my center basically, we, uh, we subsumed uh, another division from within weekend then this is the division of, har of pharmaceutical development using uh, HPC and AI. Well, simulation, uh, uh, that's, a better, that's a better wording. So, what, uh, so they, they're using AI techniques to supplement simulation um, uh, in order to come up with uh, new types of uh, drug targets. And then there are even more aggressive um, uh, endeavors like, for example, trying to replace some of the simulation components, which were done from the uh, uh, generate from first principle, some uh, equations, but replace them with empirical type of, um, uh, you know, uh, of functions, because, you know, your networks are universal functions. You can, uh, if you train them enough, you can, you know, they can mimic any function. So, uh, but, you know, they'll be a lot faster if you, and uh, if you can train them to be satisfying within the error bound, then uh, you can just uh, swap in the AI component instead of your first principle solver. So uh, there are, you know, works in that area. And, uh, and so that's a, and get, people are getting like two or three orders of magnitude speed up uh, by this. And so, so there are many, many developments of interplay between traditional simulation, AI, big data, and HPC platform support this. And that's become one of the, uh, in fact, the major uh, research target for us and also uh, our R&D of the machine moving really forward. So I expect to see a lot more cool results. Um, uh, for example, uh, we'll be entering this uh, 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 ML for face VC, which is a new benchmark for assessing the capabilities of, uh, of supercomputers for uh, machine learning workloads. And uh, uh, so uh, there are several benchmarks, one of which is to detect the uh, uh, dark matter in, uh, in galaxies. So it becomes a 3D convolution problem. But the, the world's biggest supercomputers will be competing to solve this uh, rather complicated problem. So, um, <laughs> yeah. <laughs> so we'll see uh, how Fugaku will fare. You know, we have a, a pretty good uh, team consisting of both the Fujitsu and Riken. And um, but we'll see who wins. We won the last time, but uh, we'll see who wins this time. <laughs> Um, so, uh, Dr. Satoshi Matsuoka from the Riken Institute for a talk that has spanned everything from the evolution of the universe to the detection of dark matter to breakthroughs in AI ML um, and protecting us all from COVID-19 and myriad other disasters. Thank you so much. It's been fantastic. It's been awe-inspiring. It's been really interesting. Thank you to the audience for some great questions. Could I ask for a round of applause on which to end uh, and to offer our profound thanks? Thank you very much. I just want to thank you.